Gang, this is Masad Ayub from the Pro Arms Podcast. I'm here to remind you that our podcast is a member of the Self Defense Radio Network. And I'm going to suggest you do what we do and check out the other podcasts at selfdefenseradio.net. Treat every firearm as if it's loaded. Never point a firearm at anything you're not willing to kill or destroy. Keep your finger off the trigger until you are on target and ready to fire. Always be sure of your target and what lies beyond it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Polite Society podcast. Uh, and I lost my darn show notes. Uh, let's try going over here. Welcome to the Polite Society podcast, where we're going to be recording episode 678. And it's Wednesday, October the 11th, 2023. Not Monday, it's Wednesday, October 11th. I'm Paul Lathrop. <laughs> I'm Rob Morris. On tonight's show, we'll talk with our guest Yehuda Reamer about the terrorist attacks on Israel and what they might mean for us. I'm John Richardson, and continuing on with Israel, we'll talk about the dangers of gun control. So climb aboard, strap in, and hang on. Episode 678 of the Polite Society podcast starts right now. All right. It is Wednesday night. It is just after seven o'clock in the central time zone. That me and of course central time zone being the only time zone that matters. That means it's time for an episode of Polite Society podcast. As I usually do, I'm going to go over and look at Rob and say, Rob, what have you been doing since the last time we've been on the air, man? A lot less than you think. I came back from the gun rights policy conference with a terrible cough. Unfortunately, the cough's doing well. I've been suffering for two weeks. Now that I'm just a little better, I was on Bill Freddy's Lock and Load radio show. I recorded another episode of Self-Defense Gun Stories. I had our get our friend uh, Tony Simon on. I've been building up a new handgun, and I'm confused about how it shoots. John, how about well, you? Tell us, well, tell us about the new handgun first. Um, I'm moving away from the Glock. I went and tried a bunch of different things, saw how they shot. This is a Smith & Wesson. It's got a Holosun red dot. I love the dot. But what I don't understand is the so shots are stringing horizontally. Like at 20 yards, my group is five inches wide and one inches high. And that's shooting from a sandbag. Now, this is only in the first hundred shots, but if anybody has suggestions, I'm all ears. I don't know what to do. How about you, John? What have you been up to? Well, I can't help you with that because I'm horrible on red dots. Okay. Um, this was a gun show. This was a gun show weekend, and because we had to be out of town for a relative's 90th birthday party, we I only worked the Grassroots North Carolina booth on Sunday. That said, thanks to volunteers, including last week's guest, Rob Pincus, we had a really successful show. I did come home with some ammo mint specifically for snubby revolvers and some other stuff. Uh, before on Monday, I completed my registration for, as media for the shot show. It's a go now. And last one last thing, I picked up my very own Avidity Arms PD10, which I do need to start breaking in. So we're both starting out with new pistols. Paul, yeah, what's up with us. you? Yeah. Um, What's up with me, and I mentioned this a little bit the last time I was in the air, which was on what is now being renamed Polite Society News on Friday. Uh, I've parted ways with the Second Amendment Foundation. Uh, it's kind of a mutual thing. Uh, there was no, uh, no an there remains no animosity. I still highly recommend if you are a gun owner, that you are a member and preferably a lifetime member of the Second Amendment Foundation. Uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot beyond that, uh, simply because I, I don't want to stir things. And, and I don't want words to be 
misconstrued and turned around and, and get back to the good folks at SAF. And so I'm just going to leave it at SAF and I mutually agreed to part ways and, and the polite society podcast continues my broadcast, the bullet, the bullet SAF will decide what to do with the, what I was broadcasting on Monday, Tuesday through Saturday is going to be modified a bit. It's polite society podcast news. It will happen Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday nights. And so uh, it's not going to be daily. I, I've, I, I, I have other things going on, but um, we're, we're, we, that there's going to be that change. Um, let me get this comment in here real quick, going to Rob's issues with a red dot and uh, group without sight, without accessory sight. Iron sights don't move, he says. I'll try it. Uh, I I personally I the I have a a I have two handguns that have alternate sighting. I have one that has a laser. I have one that has a red dot. And I, I personally have sight all mine in by, by sight first. And then, and then whatever L the other accessory I adjust to where it's, it's shooting rather than the other right. way around. Um, well, but, but he's saying, so who cares how this, the iron sights hold, we're pretty sure they don't move. So, from a sandbag, see if the group becomes round, and then that tells me the dot's off. Thank you, Jesus. There we go. All right, let's uh, let's do this, because Yehuda is patiently waiting for us, and I told him I'd have him out of here at a certain time. And so we got to get to break so we can get Yehuda in here, and we need to talk about the Yehuda is going to be an interview about the news. Because if you, unless you've had your head buried under a rock for the past three days, there's been big news. We'll talk to Yehud about that when we come back, right after we hear from ACLDN, right back after this. This portion of the Polite Society podcast is brought to you by the Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network. If you carry a defensive handgun, you need protection from the aftermath of prosecution. Even if you do everything right, you can be the victim of an overzealous prosecutor or even be falsely accused. That is where the ACLDN comes in. They provide immediate assistance when you need it most. If you find yourself under arrest, they immediately pay bail money and the retainer for your attorney. Additional funds are available for trial and civil proceedings. Beyond the money, they have far and away the best team in the industry, providing you invaluable information and training DVDs that are included with your membership and who stand ready to work with your lawyer on your defense. People like Masad Ayub, John Farnham, James Fleming, Tom Givens, Emmanuel Kappelson, Dennis Tuller, and led by Network President Marty Hayes. Initial membership is only $135 for your first year, and you get eight incredible training DVDs and other educational material when you join. If you don't have tens of thousands of dollars to defend yourself at your disposal right now, you need to be a member of the ACLDN. Go to armedcitizensnetwork.org and become a member today. And please mention that you heard about them on the Polite Society podcast. All right, we are back. And as I stated before the break, joining us, Yehuda Reamer. Yehuda is, uh, well, uh, most people know Yehuda as the Pew Pew Jew. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and lead off by uh, uh, saying, Yehuda, obviously, uh, as, as known by your tagline, you, you are a member of uh, the Jewish belief. And this past week, there has been, uh, I believe it happened uh, Sunday into Monday, my timeline was when I started hearing about horrific attacks that are happening in Israel. And the, the more time goes on, the more we see the absolute horrible atrocities that have, have been committed by, by uh, terrorist groups in Israel. And you're, one of the things you're doing, and I want to jump right to the end at the beginning, and then we'll cover everything else. The reason we have to get you out of here at a certain time tonight is you are going to be doing a, a introduction to firearms class short for, for 
for members of the Jewish persuasion right after we get done here. Uh, it, how big is this being received in, in the Jewish community in the United States? Oh, it's, it's across the United States. Uh, I have gun ranges that I, that I know the owner is in in Florida and other states, uh, Los Angeles, all, you know, messaging me and saying, Hey guy, no, Hey man, well, we have this massive outreach of people who are coming in and wanting to learn, learn about firearms, learn about, you know, how to shoot, what to buy training. And I'm sorry if I sound a little incoherent tonight, but I'm just, wiped um from everything i've been dealing with but no it's it's really been um unfortunately it takes tragedy to wake people up but uh there's supposed to be like i said i'm doing a it's not really an intro to fire i mean it it's more an intro to people who are interested in buying firearms kind of walking them through the process you know explaining to them that uh if you want a gun don't listen to anyone who tells you this is the gun you want you got to go put hands on the firearm and make sure that it fits you. Uh, so, you know, it's it's just been crazy. There's been such an uh, uptick. I mean, every time you hear Jews being attacked uh, anywhere in the world or even in America, there's always an uptick. But I've never seen anything like this. This is a different level of interest. All right. Uh, I, I, I'm into that. I understand the sympathy of... And, and that's that's sort of my first question to you. It's not like we haven't said you might want a gun for self-defense. Yehuda, it, I think of Jews as being insightful, well-informed, intelligent, and they had to get hit from behind with a two-by-four before they went, what? I might want to defend myself? Look, I expect that from Americans, but we're seeing it not only in the U.S., we have almost seen that same response from Israelis, how their government treated them. Um, is this the human condition? You got any insight? I'll be honest. The, the Israeli government, I don't think, treated their people bad. The problem is that they have horrendous gun laws. Um, you know, uh, just, to, just to lay out a few things about that quickly is you're only allowed to, one, uh, to own one handgun at a time, and that gun is registered, and if you wanted, let's say, go from a Glock to a SIG or whatever brand, you have to go turn in your gun, buy the new gun, re-register it. Uh, so that's that's a hassle. On top of that, um, as of a few days ago, you were only allowed 50 rounds of ammo in your home at any given time, uh, which we see what happened. We, we clearly saw what happened when, when that's the case. Um, you are not allowed to own any long guns. So despite... IWI coming out, you know, with the Tavor and the Galil and the new Carmel and, um, you know, a bunch of other type of weapons, uh, Israeli civilians cannot own long guns. And everyone's like, well, I see people in Israel carrying them all the time. But yes, those are either on-duty soldiers or off-duty soldiers. You know, they're, they have a weekend leave. They're still mandated to carry a firearm with them uh, anywhere they go. But to the most part, if you live in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, it is very difficult uh, to get a firearm. Now, the the new minister, the minister of defense did, uh, or interior, I don't even remember what his um, position was, but he basically came out and said, oh, we're going to uh, re uh, loosen our gun laws. So now you can own 100 rounds of ammo. And instead of coming in person to have a if you want to apply for a permit, you have to go into wh wherever you go to, let's say the local government or whatever, and you need to be interviewed. And then they can determine whether or not you'll be able to get one. So instead of doing that, now they'll do, do a phone interview. But from what I read, that it's still a week wait until you can actually get the permit. So like, what so the hell? Do uh, how joke when, when terrorists are at the door, your permit is only a week away. Yeah, pr pretty much. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that's an absolute atrocity. I think that Israel needs to arm their civilians now. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's something that is negotiable. Uh, obviously, I'm not an Israeli citizen. I, I don't live there. I've, I have lived there for a couple of years. I've been to Israel numerous times. But I think it's an absolute atrocity that they are making them still jump through hoops when 
we've only seen this is only the beginning. Uh, you know, there you 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 have ISIS or not not ISIS. You have um, the Taliban who was uh, you know armed by Joe Biden, calling saying, "Hey, the minute you give us the green light, we'll march in there and eradicate the Jews." You, uh, I think I saw that uh, rockets from Lebanon were flying in today. I mean, this is a legit military operation from millions upon millions of people who want to see Israel eradicated. Yet the Israeli government still thinks it's it's smart to not arm their civilians. And I think that is an apps like I said repeatedly, it's an absolute atrocity. And I'm not even coming. I'm not even coming from like. You know, oh, it's the Jewish people. I'm like these are just normal people who want to live their lives, who are being systematically murdered. I mean, we haven't seen, we haven't seen, the, we haven't seen deaths like this from, uh, uh, you know, perpetrated on Jews since the Holocaust. I mean, I think 900 people in two days, including beheading of 40 children, and when I say children, babies. I mean, it, it, it just it just boggles the mind, and and I I don't. I honestly don't have a response to it because I think all of us have the exact same response that it's absolutely absurd. You know, one thing I notice about this compared to previous wars, say the six days war or the Yom Kippur war, where it was the military that was attacked, whether it was the Syrians coming across the Golan Heights in the Yom Kippur war, the Egyptians coming across Sinai. This time, it was civilians in particular that were targeted, much more so than military targets. Um, well, not not sorry, John. Not 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 even much more so. Completely. That there was, I think there was one military target that was uh, attacked, but they literally came in on a Jewish holiday and and murdered hundreds. One of the Questions that had come up, people had asked me, and I know that a lot of the attacks were on kibbutzes. For people who do not know what a kibbutz is, could you define what a kibbutz? I mean, it's a, it seems to be a, a strongly Israeli type of community. Think think of it the easiest way to understand it. Thinking of it, think of it as like a commune. Just like, you know, uh, an area where people live, all work together, um, almost like a socialist utopia, if you will, but not necessarily socialist. But, uh, you know, everyone works together, chips in, um, and it's just like a, a, a lot of times it's a gated community, uh, quasi-city town, if you will, that, you know, people live their lives normally. Okay, thanks. Let me get some comments in here quick. And uh, first, I'm going to get, we don't have the name for this one, just coming off of a group in Facebook. Uh, says, this guy knows what he's talking about. Glad to hear from him. And uh, thank uh, you. Carrie Ann, uh, Sisters in Arms of Fire and Story, Carrie Ann, who is, is quite often with us and joins us as a member of the staff, says, the Minister of National Security announced Sunday today I di directed the Firearms Licensing Division to go on an emergency operation to, and and I, th I think this is something you, you mentioned earlier, is that they're going to open up licensing, but it's still licensing, and it's still handgun, and it's still 50 or 100 rounds. Um, I, I'm just... So I... I I think I did hear that they might be passing out some long guns, but again, waiting a week is, is, I mean, we saw what they did in, in 36 hours. Imagine another week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Paul, Paul, do you have another question? Or go, can I throw go. one in? Um, Yehuda, is one segment of American Jews more interested in firearms than the other? We, from the outside, oh, they're American Jews, but you guys are, that's a huge spectrum. That's not monolithic. Right. So it, this is, this is like a whole podcast in itself and I'm happy to come back on, but in, in, in a very brief uh, description, 
you have uh, Orthodox Jews, you have conservative Jews, and I don't mean politically conservative, and then you have mm-hmm. Reformed Jews. Now, a lot of Reformed Jews, and and this is not a blanket statement for anyone that's watching, a lot of Reformed Jews and a lot of conservative Jews tend to be a lot more liberal. So you have a lot of them being anti-gun. Um, Orthodox Jews themselves fall into like three categories, maybe four. You have Jews who are pro-gun, pro-Second Amendment, but don't want to have, um, and again, Orthodox Jews, pro-gun, pro-Second Amendment, but don't want to have anything to do with guns. They don't want guns in the home. They don't want guns around their kids. Then you have your closet gun owners who will buy a gun, maybe go to the range and, you know, think that they're safe and stuff because they have a gun which they think is a magic talisman. Um, Then you have your Jews who actually do go out and train now, when I say that, I'm talking about a, a like 1% of all Orthodox Judaism will go out and train and get some decent training. Um, and then I can probably count on my, on my one hand the amount of Jews who are doing what I'm doing, being vocal, being out there, not afraid to stand up for the Second Amendment and advocate for it. I may be... Um... I may be saying something that's outrageous and wrong, but uh, I, all week long I've been drawing lines in my head. <laughs> Israel seems to be slowly stepping towards arming citizens. Uh, Ukraine, you want a full auto machine gun? Come get one. Come defend your homeland. <laughs> uh, just the the the. The differences between the two are striking in my head. Uh, yeah, I, I agreed. Uh, like I said, I understand Israel has been very apprehensive uh, for for years. I mean, I, I mean, for as long as I I've known them to have very draconian gun laws. I get it. You know, they they have very little uh, gun crime. There's no school shootings, or not that I know of, and I understand that, but. We see it all the time. We say it all the time here, right? The only thing that will beat a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And Israel touts themselves to be the good guys, which I 100% believe. But if that's the case, they need to fight fire with fire. Um, Now, I get we have the IDF, but they are only so big. And if you get the civilians involved, they will be able to patrol the streets and let the military do the heavy lifting going into Gaza, you know, carpet bombing the hell out of them, doing what needs to be done to eradicate Hamas off the face of the planet once and for all. Yehuda, correct me Um, if I'm wrong, but I was going to just say, Israel has virtually uniform, universal uh, conscription where for both men and women with few exceptions so most Israelis of a certain age, whether they were younger or older, have some experience with firearms. So to go to your point, you have people that are trained. It's foolish not to take advantage of that. No, 100%. Uh, I believe that once you're out of the military, you're in the reserves up till 45. So... Uh, I have a cousin right now who's on the front lines who was who did his uh, three or four years in the military, got out, uh, married a beautiful girl. They have two little kids, and uh, they he's on the front lines. Uh, he was called up, and that's very common. Um, I know I saw a picture of one of the actors from Fauda. Uh, he's on the front lines, you know. He a huge actor in Israel, but he's on his uniform and he's on the front line so um yeah they have it but the rule is once you are out of the military persona non grata you want to get a handgun fine um so yeah i want to get one comment in here from george geller george says reform judaism is basically democratic party with jewish holidays i hope that changes and you're working to change that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. They, you can, you can, if George, if you're still walking, if you're still watching, we call them ginos, right? Jews in name only. Okay. <laughs> um, 
the, the one but yes, I'm I'm trying I'm trying very hard to change that. One thing that 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 entered my head as you were starting to say that, and and, and uh, you have a T-shirt out that's available. I believe it's probably one at least recently one of the very top selling T-shirts on your website has got to be the one that says. People with ARs don't get in cattle cars. A very powerful uh, statement. And, yeah. And I think it still at this point speaks to people with ARs don't have their children beheaded in their homes. And I, I'm sorry if that's offending to some people, but that has been happening. No, that's a hundred percent. Yeah. People with ARs don't get in cattle cars. And, and I, I love that shirt. Um, I can't, I actually can't take credit and I wish more than anything. I remember one of my followers said something similar and I asked, I, I messaged him like, Hey man, can I, can I run with that and put it on the shirt? He's like, yeah, he goes, I don't even care. He, and, and, and I feel horrible. I would love to give him signed copies of my books or something like that, because that is my all time best uh, item on my website, period. Uh, and it is a fantastic shirt. And for all those out there that are like, yeah, when I was in the military, we had ARs and we got in cattle cars when they took us from one base to another. You guys are all idiots <laughs> and I, I hate you and you are destroying the message. So if you feel like saying that, just know uh, I don't like you. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that uh, uh, it is a very powerful shirt um, and I always get looks when I wear mine. Uh, you know, I, I uh, expanded that to T-shirts, hoodies, mugs, stickers, flags, uh, a lot of other things that you can get that message put on. Rob, you got another question. The, 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 the vast majority of Jews are outside of the gun culture. Where do they have to come up to? Where can they go to come up to speed? I guess just like anybody else, walk into the local gun shop and suffer the the new guy questions and start there uh i mean i i am working on something that i i cannot discuss right now um but it it can definitely change the fabric of jewish gun ownership in the country and it's something that i'm it's in the early stages and i'm i'm beyond excited for it um obviously i don't know if it will end up going through but it could it could really do a lot of good and make it a home for Jews. Uh, but yes, if Jews now are interested, 99% of gun ranges, if you walk in and say, hey, I'm scared, walk me through the process, they most gun ranges won't have a problem. They'll understand. Uh, and again, that's what I'm doing tonight in uh, 25 minutes is discussing with members of my community Again, you know, they, they want to get guns, um, and I'm going to walk them through the process of, you know, living with guns in the home. So they can reach out to me on any social media platform speaking as well. Of, speaking of reaching out to you on social media, I want to get this one in from Unapologetically Armed. Been following you on X, Pew Pew. Uh, X, of course, being the, the platform for, formerly known as Twitter. You, you have put yourself in an incredible position to be the information resource to your community. It's now scrambling to avail you themselves out of fear and desperation. And unapologetically, it doesn't show up on screen, but uh, finishes it up with bless you. Um. Well, thank, thank you, uh, unapologetically armed. Um, I don't know if you saw my post that I wrote uh, a couple hours ago, but uh, basically said, you know, it took, uh, the first set, for the last seven years, it's always been about me. Um, I mean, I, I'll even read it because I, I think some people didn't get the idea of the post. But um, uh, we're here. Uh, for seven years, it has been about me. For seven years, I've worked tirelessly to build my brand and reputation. For seven years, I've strategically positioned myself as a unique entity in a world where Jews didn't exist. In the last two days, all the hard work is paying off. So... I am I am now in a position where through my hard work I had three people today alone call me at, who have they have siblings fighting in Israel and they want to get plate carriers uh, or actually the plates 
sent to their siblings in Israel. And I, I've been able to use connections to hook them up with companies that are able to get them. Um, I've been able to, you know, secure ammo for people uh, at a good rate. So I, I've all my hard work. Again, I wish it wasn't the case. I wish, you know, people were coming willingly and not out of fear. But um, I'm I'm not a person who will judge why and when a person decides to get a firearm. Um, if if someone, you know, I I always will check my ego at the door. Uh, I I have people contact me today who for years have been calling me crazy and a gun nut and I'm I'm nuts. And, you know, I'm going to check the ego at the door. I'm going to help them with what they need. And once they get into firearms, then I'll go after them and make fun of them and, and make them apologize. But until then, I'm checking the ego at the door and uh, ensuring that Jews are safe. All right. One more Please. here. And uh, this will lead into my next question. Uh, C&T Designs and Arms says, and buy Yehuda's new book. Um, oh, I love Will. Will, Will at C and T. Um, he he and I have become good friends. He, I, I try to keep my private life. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm very secretive about keeping my private life and business life, um, you know, uh, a separate. But C and T Design Will, um, he has been allowed into my private life, and. Um, I think I got the, I got the much better end of the deal. He's been helping me with a few projects for my kids. He does amazing metalwork design, so he's been doing some stuff for my kids, and I definitely got the better end of the deal uh, because I traded a couple, you know, designing a new logo and a couple signed books for what he did for me. And uh, but he is a really good guy, and actually someone I enjoy talking to on the phone because he's kind of got the same sense of humor that I do. Yeah, I, oh, uh, that's Coop, dangerous. Coop comes in, and helps me on, uh, helps me on the weekend broadcast. I'm I'm familiar with Coop. I, I I enjoy interacting with him when he's able to come and join me on the weekend broadcasts. And I hope now that that moves to Sunday, he can continue to come and join me from time to time on the weekend review shows. So, uh, all right, let's. We, I told you I'd have you out of here by 40 minutes after the hour. We're getting perilously close to that. Yehuda, any final messages or anything you want to plug today, man? Uh, no, just, you know, if uh, I was talking on um, uh, a po uh, two podcasts yesterday, include, including Cam Edwards, and, and so many people have asked me what they can do, how they can help. Um, obviously, in America, the only help I need is just funds to buy ammo so I can continue training with uh, Jews who want to learn. But if you want to do something for Israel, uh, there's two really good organizations that are on the on the ground um, that are uh, one of them is called Magen David Dome and the other one is Hatsala United or United Hatsala. And both those organizations are kind of like a first responder civilian unit. But they are always the ones that help when there's a, a terrorist attack. They're the ones going around right now, you know, saving people and civilians and, and applying um, medicine and, and, you know, just they're doing really amazing work. So if anyone wants to help people in Israel, the best way to do it is donate money to those two organizations, Magain Davida Dome and uh, United Hatsala. And I can't stress enough how much they need that help. So... That's really what I need. I would leave people with. All right. Very cool. You, Thank you. We are right up on Thank the you. time. I told you I would let you go. So I am going to let you go. Everybody, Yehuda. Reamer, Appreciate it. Go find. He's pew pew Jew everywhere on social media. He's got an Instagram following that I think on Instagram, he's bigger than Trump. I really do. But, uh, <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think Trump's on Instagram anymore. So I might be. Well, then you're bigger. Exactly. But anyway, go follow him. And uh, thanks again, Yehuda, for joining us tonight. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Any, and uh, I'll come back anytime. All right. Folks, we are going to step aside to break. When we come back, we've got our news segment, and we'll get to that right after we hear from a Complete Combatant right back after this. 
This portion of the Polite Society podcast is brought to you by The Complete Combatant. The Complete Combatant is designed for a broad base of citizens that range from students that don't own a gun on up to advanced students that train often. The Complete Combatant offers several different courses that build upon each other from avoidance, using verbal commands, and preparing for contact, lethal versus non-lethal decisions, your 911 call, interacting with the police, to even dealing with the legal system in the aftermath. The Complete Combatant courses are a layered approach for all levels of experience that will walk you through all the many stages of decisions while developing a game plan tailored to your skills and your everyday carry. Please visit www.thecompletecombatant.com and make sure you mention this ad to receive 15% off. Again, that's www.thecompletecombatant.com and mention the ad for 15% off. All right, we are back. This is the news segment of the Polite Society podcast. I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to lead things off. Those of you who have been watching or listening to the Polite Society podcast recently know that I, I've been using AI, but in the switch to get uh, everything moved over to the new computer, I don't have I didn't have time to have AI program to read all the news stories. So we're going to do it ourselves tonight. Uh, Rob, do you want to take the first one, man? On Saturday, the terrorist group Hamas attacked multiple places across southern Italy, uh, southern Israel. That's why we have AI. Their attack was on both military and civilian targets, but predominantly civilians. An estimated 800 plus Israelis were killed. Many more were wounded. Over 100 were kidnapped as hostage, hostages. Many of the victims were children. We talk about gun-free zones on this podcast. A music festival called Supernova was targeted, even though it was out and isolated in the Negev desert near the border from with Gaza. Firearms and sharp instruments were forbidden by festival organizers at the concert. When Hamas attacked, the festival goers were defenseless. So far, out of that concert, 260 bodies have been recovered. Many assume that Israeli civilians are well-armed. That's profoundly wrong. While many, both male and female, have served in the IDF and continue to serve as reservists, very, very few civilians are allowed a private firearm or allowed to carry in public. It's estimated that only 2.5% of Israeli adults have a firearm permit of any kind. This allows them one firearm, a handgun, and to have 50 rounds of ammunition in their home, maximum. As a result of the attacks, Israel loosened their gun control laws. Israeli Minister of National Security announced on Sunday that he'd ordered officials responsible for issuing gun license to broaden their standards. Let me give you a quote. Quote, today I directed the Firearm Licensing Division to go on an emergency operation in order to allow as many citizens as possible to arm themselves. The plan will take effect within 24 hours, but the new licenses will take over a week to be issued. Now, this is translating from Hebrew. Bear with me. He will also allow permit holders to have, oh, now it's up to 100 rounds of ammunition in their home. I'm going to editorialize that many of us use 100 rounds in a single IDPA match or trip to the range. The new regulations are still incredibly strict. Carry is primarily restricted to your own residence in an eligible settlement. Rifle veterans, officers with the rank of lieutenant and above, and combatants with the rank of major and above in the IDF and in the security forces, firefighters, policemen, workers and volunteers in the rescue forces, they're allowed to be armed. That doesn't make sense to me. As Michael Bain warned many times in times of unrest or natural disaster, we're on our own. John, what do you think? Well, you know, after our interview with Yehuda, it got me to thinking about a, a parallel 
instance, and it was the Pulse nightclub attack and the gay community and how in the aftermath we now have, just like with the Pulse nightclub, we have people wanting to be armed. Perhaps we need something like Operation Blazing Sword for those in the Jewish community who need an introduction to firearms, who want to know some more, whether or not they ultimately decide to get armed, at least they would have some education and information and maybe a little bit of training. Rob? There's some good news in that regard, John. 40% of us in the United States live in a home that has a firearm. I think we're easy to find. Now, that's just because all my buddies are posting their targets on Facebook. So I, 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 we're not hidden. And I think many of us would bend over backwards to teach their neighbors who don't feel safe how to defend themselves. Paul, what are you thinking? I was just, uh, as you were reading this, I, I remembered a social media post by uh, um, I, I, goodness. I, anyway, I remembered a social media post that happened shortly after this. Uh, 800 Israelis killed. And the, the thought goes, well, this is like 911. This is much worse than 911, 2001. Uh, I want to just compare the, and I did this real quick. Israel has a population for the entire country of 9,506,000, so 9.5 million. That's roughly the population of New York City and Washington, D.C. And they've had, they had more people killed per capita just in the whole nation than we had in 9/11, it, this is this is horrific, and the people killed in 9/11. There were some children killed, but most of what was killed were adults. We've had documented cases of infants being beheaded. Uh, the 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 this is absolutely it's it's hard to overstate. What is what the the terror that has happened here, uh, John? What do you think, man? Let's go to Rob first. Yeah, Paul. To do the math for you, it's the proportional equivalent, as if twenty four thousand victims in the United States were killed on the first day. Yeah, and John we had two thousand. Period. Three thousand. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah, and just kind of bringing this all to a conclusion again. It just goes to illustrate how gun-free zones and gun control kill when good people are prevented from defending themselves. Yes, the, the rules are loosening up in Israel and good for them. Yes, there, I've heard there are 10,000 rifles now being sent to kibbutz and community security teams in Gaza and other places where they would be most useful. That said, that should have been a security team, unarmed security team that's two miles from Gaza was a sitting duck. Um, oh, yeah. You could have said something, and I, I was too caught up in what he said to, to try and correct him. He said that Jews feel safe because there haven't been school shootings. Well, there have. Most of them were by yeah. Palestinians. In fact, we learned from them about how to protect our schools. And I wonder why exactly. they forgot those lessons. Yeah. All right, let's, uh, I want to get a comment in here real quick and we'll move on. Uh, CNT Designs at Arms, 100 rounds is not even a good functions test. You know, I, I, I used to listen a lot to Tom Gresham. And one of the things he recommends when you buy a new firearm is you put 100 rounds of defensive ammo through the thing before you trust your life with it. Um, I myself, I don't put 100. I put a couple mags. I put 100 rounds of some of the crappiest ammo. I just general ammo I find 
usually on the internet. I'll put 100 rounds of random 9mm ammo through a 9mm handgun. Then I'll put two magazines of, uh, of defensive ammo through it. And if it makes it through both, and it, now let me get, let me absolutely be clear about this. I will get with random ammo, I do get ammo failures, but I do not want ejection failures. I do not want fouling of the gun. If that gun will eat anything and then eat defensive ammo correctly, then it's my carry gun and I'll trust it with my life. I've got two of them that I currently use that have passed that test. And I'm going to say there's been thousands of rounds in through those firearms. Well, continuing on with what you just said, Paul, last week when we had Rob Pincus on, he described some of the problems that good defensive ammo had feeding into the PD-10. Some did really well. Some might have been a little shorter. The angle wasn't just quite right. You've got to find what works with your handgun. All right. Should we uh, head off to the next story, guys? Yes. Please. All right. Judge stops some provisions of the Maryland killer carry killer bill. Again, another good reason we use AI. The judge stopped the private building consent rule, which declares all private property that is open to the public to be a prohibited place unless the property owner expressly allows individuals to enter the premises with a firearm. The coat court also enjoined the ban on carrying in a place where alcoholic beverages were consumed from taking effect. The court rejected the state's argument that establishments serving alcohol do not become sensitive places merely because they attract crowds that would effectively make every place where people gather a sensitive place. The Supreme Court deliberately said that being around other people does not remove your right to self-defense. The court also stopped the ban on carrying at public demonstrations. The court rightly recognized that six out of the 13 original colonies required their citizens to go armed when attending public assemblies, and the law was completely inconsistent with that historical tradition. So some good news for Maryland. John, you're up first in show notes with a comment. What you got? Yeah, and if I understand correctly from what was allowed where this was not enjoined, where the carry restrictions are still effective, it includes state parks and state forests. And all I can think about is how many, and I hate to say women, have been attacked, or just how many people in general have been attacked. They're out running, they're out hiking by themselves or in a small group. There's nobody there to help you. You're out in the middle of nowhere half the time, and it's a place where you would need to be armed and def not defenseless more than any other place. I know here in North Carolina, we had to change the law so that you could be armed in state parks. Rob? I This is speculation, and I wonder if this case will be treated like similar cases that we saw in the Ninth Circuit and the Second Circuit, if the stay will now be overturned by the full circuit court. Anyone care to speculate? John? Yeah, I do, because this is in the Fourth Circuit, which I live in. In days gone by, I would have said the stays would not have been overturned, but... During the Obama administration, the Fourth Circuit went left, which is sad because Obama had more appointees and some of the senior judges in the Fourth Circuit, well, some of the older judges went on the senior status. Um, it's not the conservative. It sure as heck isn't the Fifth Circuit. Let's just put it that way. I mean, I would right. love that our judges, the Fourth Circuit would be like the Fifth Circuit, but I know they're not. Yeah. Um, and as while we're speaking of uh, circuits, I want to just interject quickly. News did come down that the Ninth Circuit has done, shall we say, the Texas two-step, even though they're a long ways from Texas. 
they the Ninth Circuit did des- decide to take on an emergency appeal on Bonk. The entire Ninth Circuit took the uh, Bonta v. Uh, help me out, guys. I had the Duncan v. Bonta. Duncan v. Bonta. Thank yeah. you. Uh, took that case up on appeal and has already overturned not not overturned it but has already granted the state of california's request for a stay on the order pending the full hearing of that case before the en banc that is going to take probably a year to go through and so the state of california if you live in california or any other of the states in the ninth circuit you're going to have to wait and probably about another year before this can be kicked up to the U.S. Supreme Court and Judge Thomas can get his shot at it. Paul, can I make Um, one correction here? Yeah. In the Ninth Circuit, you do not have all the judges participating in an en banc hearing. In this time, because it's such a large circuit, they have 27, 28 judges. Here you only have 11. More importantly... Is the same 11 plus one got replaced who heard Duncan v. Bonta back in 2019, which the Supreme Court took on certiorari and sent back, remanded back to them and told them, in light of Bruin, you need to get this right. And so they pulled it up again. They said, oh, we were the ones who had it originally, so we should be the ones hearing it. Yeah, uh, and and this will the a, a right and there was some sarcasm there. Right denied. Yeah, um, and and I wonder if the appellants can ask the U.S. Supreme Court to review. I think they could, and I think there may be some cause for an emergency uh, appeal so that it can be heard. the The cases for this session have already been you know they've already been chosen. Uh, the, the oral arguments start late this month, early next month. So um, there's I, still the shadow docket. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, let's see here. Let me go to see if we got any comments come in. No, we're good there. Uh, Rob, why don't we go ahead and talk about this uh, Miami state senator? A Democrat senator from Miami again called for repeal of Florida's stand your ground law. It sounds like he got his talking points from Bloomberg. That prohibits the, this is how it goes. His proposal prohibits the use of deadly force by a person who knows that he or she can avoid the necessity with complete safety by retreating. That's a synopsis synopsis of his SB 96. Does anybody know anything with complete certainty? No, Um, No, but I'm not. Not when my door gets kicked in, everything's up for grabs. I just want to know how large a campaign contribution he just got. Right. Yes. Um, Do I know with complete certainty I can retreat? No. Um, is there, is there, speak, it's going to Rob's scenario of somebody's kicking in my door. If I go to retreat out my back door, am I certain there's not somebody back there waiting for me? The average home invasion is done by, what is it, 2.3 people? So, right. Yeah. Am I sure he doesn't have a friend out back just waiting for me? No. Uh, am, am, am I sure that, that I'm going to be able to, in, in a public arena, Am I sure what's beyond that escape door? No. Uh, the, the, this, this, is, uh, this is ridiculousness, in my opinion only. Should we go to New Jersey and then some good news out of Tennessee? Sure. Um, yeah. All I have is a link here, Rob, so take, take it away, man. Well, no, I was going to well, – John said uh, wanted to take us to New Jersey here. Yeah. A New Jersey judge said that in a said that CAD files are not protected speech. And it was in a case brought by the Second Amendment Foundation, a defense distributed. 
And the CAD files in question were the CAD files used to do 3D guns. And it brings up the question, is digital music protected speech? Are TV signals protected speech? Are works of art or sculpture still protected speech? Is a piece of plastic that requires modification and machining a firearm? What about any manufacturing CAD files? I'm coming this is me. Any manufacturing CAD files or works of an architect who designed using AutoCAD or one of the CAD programs? Is that protected speech? I, I'm sure this case will be appealed, but I would call upon every manufacturing firm, the U.S. Um, U.S. Manufacturers Associations, they need to get involved in this. It is not just firearms. Rob? Um, if it's not protected speech, does it still have patent protection? Or copyright? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, patent is typically for technic. Uh, artifacts or processes and copyright is typically for literature, but right. Uh, interest. This, this raises more questions than it actually answers. Yeah, uh, what about CAD files? The, the code that is then printed out in a document, the book itself is the book not protected speech. Yeah. If you could then, OCR and just translate it into you know, code? That re um, when, when this whole thing started breaking, Firearms Policy Coalition printed a book. The entire text mm -hmm. of the book was ones and zeros. It was the digital code for, I believe, the Liberator handgun um, that, uh, that you could 3D print. Now, there have been so many advances since then that I don't know that I would ever print a Liberator, but even though I still have the files, uh, but um, that, that, that it brings up, do I have to go turn in my book now because it's not protected speech? Me too, because I have a copy of the book somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Rob, let's let's talk Tennessee, man. This is good news. Smith & Wesson, the firearms manufacturer, opened the doors of its new manufacturing building in Tennessee. It's beginning to move its operations from Massachusetts. S&W is investing $125 million into new plants and equipment during this move. John? Yeah, the new location is in Maryville, Tennessee, which is just outside, just outside the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. It's a beautiful, just south of Knoxville in East Tennessee, and the governor was there. Obviously, lots of politicians, and I understood that students demanding action, along with the demanding mommies, marched against it. And the leader of it was from pro, was like from Vanderbilt, and like, yeah, well. Obviously, he didn't go to UT, so whatever. <laughs> um, and just, again, the, the astroturf uh, uh, of those those uh, ground uh, the grassroots, they're, they're not grassroots, they're astroturf. I would bet you every person that was there demonstrating was paid and had their transportation provided for them. They were protesting against and the t-shirts were provided as well yeah uh, i will say this for tennessee i mean it's not just smith and wesson that they've attracted they've attracted most of the manufacturing operation for beretta the u.s manufacturing we know they still do tons of stuff over in italy but they moved down from maryland um you have barrett which is just south of nashville they've been well they started there Oh, I'm trying to think. But in general, you're seeing manufacturing companies leaving anti-freedom states, whether it was a small company like Les Bear left Illinois, crossed the river, 
into Iowa. You see Smith & Wesson coming south. You see Beretta going south. You saw PTR Industries go to leave Connecticut, went to Ainer, South Carolina. You saw Stag Arms leave Connecticut, moved to, I believe, Wyoming. Yeah. Your own home state of South Dakota, Paul, is got a great outreach to gun companies and the gun industry to relocate uh, to South Dakota. Will have you know, it's a it's a cause for economic development in your state. It is. And, and, Shea and, you know, is out of uh, Huntington. Well, and. I got I got a suppressed thought, engage or engage thought before engaging mouth. Um, <laughs> I almost said something that would have got me in hot water, but I'm going to say this: one advantage Tennessee has, and I do not know this for a fact, but I'm guessing, and I believe I'm right. It has in common with South Dakota, no personal income tax, and You're correct no corporate income tax. Which means don't know about that. The 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 uh, companies moving there get the, get a natural tax break in that there's they get to keep more of what they make. The people that work for those companies have a huge benefit, and that for example in California when I lived there I was paying five percent of my income to the state, and you, I don't have to do that here. A, a huge incentive for bright people to move to free states. I wouldn't mind 5% and North Carolina paying five and a quarter, well, but we this, don't have killers. Don't have killer property taxes either. Well, and remember this is from the 1990s is when I lived the, the late 1990s is when I lived in California. I got out of there just around the uh, Y2K. So uh, I, I got to experience that. No, my computer did not die in a free state. <clears throat> so uh, let's go ahead and do this. We're gonna let me check, and I, I need I need more monitors here. I used to have four. Now I've got three. I'll probably have another monitor by the time that I shut everything down tonight. Um, going back to a previous story, Dana commented, and I want to get that comment up. I know with complete certainty that I am not. Certain of anything. Good point, Dana. Good point. Uh, let's go ahead and go to break, our final break. We're going to combine our DGU and our uh, closing the show up into one segment. We're going to hear from JPFO, and we'll be right back right after this. It all failed before. Alcohol prohibition brought us organized crime and no less alcohol. Drug prohibition brought us murderous, no-knock, wronghouse raids. Police, search warrant! No, wait! The crack house is next door! Now gun prohibitionists want laws to lead us down that same path. Don't Americans ever learn? Just ask yourself, isn't government the only beneficiary of police state policies? All in favor of gun control, raise your right hand. Brought to you by Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership. Information available at jpfo.org. Okay, after a couple of years of running ads like that one... Uh, and I believe most of the ads do say something to the effect of, isn't government the only beneficiary of anti-gun policies? I'm going to say no. The government is not, I have to take uh, take issue with the ad, the government is not the only beneficiary. Terrorists and criminals are huge beneficiaries to anti-gun policies. Um I'm going to start off here by our normal disclaimer. These discussions are not legal advice. Some of us are trainers, but this is not formal training, and you need formal training. The defensive gun use segment is intended as information only, and well, information and education, not as training. As always, the opinions of the hosts are only their own opinions and not those of any sponsors or other affiliations. John, I think you signed up to do the first one out of Phoenix, man. Yeah. Phoenix police were called to the South Phoenix area after a report of shots fired. It was after 2 a.m. in the morning. While they were in the area, a police helicopter spotted a vehicle speeding away from the area. Earlier that evening, a man was at home when two armed strangers broke into his 
into this house and pistol whipped him in the face. The man broke free and ran to the back of his house with the two intruders right behind him. Fortunately, he grabbed a semi-automatic rifle and began firing at his attackers. The pair of thugs decided this place was not the place they wanted to be. They ran from the home, but not soon enough to avoid being shot. The resident told police he believed he had been set up at another location. The person came over to his home after getting the address from the man, and after 45 minutes, they left. Afterwards, they texted the, texted the man that they had left something at the home. When they returned to get the, returned to get the item, the attack happened. When police pulled over the speeding car, they found two of the three people in the car had been shot. A 19-year-old woman and a man had been shot. She later died at the hospital. The 23-year-old driver was taken into custody. The driver and the surviving home intruder have been charged with numerous felonies, including first-degree homicide. Um, I'm glad the guy had an AR. One of the disadvantages of a long gun is it's very seldom with us. When you think about it, if we had the choice, we'd always have a long gun, except you ever trip and fall over it while you're carrying it? It can't dance. It's hard to sit down. I think the man would have been safer with a pistol. Mm -hmm. Quite possibly. One, one thing I want to bring up on this one is the, and I, and I really glad that a whole lot of states do this, not every state, but most do. If you are a participant in a felony where someone dies, you get charged with murder. Two of these people have been charged with murder, even though the young lady that was uh, also involved in it was the one that died, and they didn't specifically kill anybody. It was because of their actions that she died or she assisted in. the. They assisted her in those actions. At any rate, I'm glad to see these two... Uh, I don't even want to call them human beings. Uh, th these two individuals were charged with murder. I, I believe mm -hmm. that's termed felony murder. Yes. Yeah. On to Grant County, Washington. Yes, sir. Sam Kay had just finished bailing hay, and he's headed to a Eric Church concert. This event didn't turn out he wanted it kind of left the road and went off the rails he finished just before 17 rounded up his three youngest sons gets in his pickup and heads to the amphitheater um it's basically a venue for fancy burgers and hanging out they're passing a farm store that he leases and he's in the process of purchasing that store when he spots a small car outside the building well, that set off some bells in the back of his head. So Sam K pulls over. He parks the truck, walks over to the car, and looks in. On the front passenger seat, there's a gas can. In the back, there's a massage table and a weed eater, along with a few other items. He goes, I'm trying to figure out what kind of party that looks like. And it seemed more likely that the items were stolen. The property was silent and did appear to be anybody inside or nearby, but he went back to his truck and got his gun. He also called 911 and said, guys, I think there's a burglary in process. He walks toward the corner of the bu uh, building and he sees an intruder. As he cleared the corner, one man was closer to him and another individual armed with a billy club starts to run him down. He points his gun at the attacker and uses a, the best command voice he can drum up and says, get on the ground. And one of the two attackers complied. The other put up a fight. Uh, he, they says, what do you mean? We're here to rent the building. His boys were still in the truck. They saw what happened. The Grant County Sheriff's Office determined that the pair of suspects were on the property for criminal purposes based on shoe prints that they found in the building where the kids had broken in. Mr. K had previously reported crimes, but due to lack of evidence, the complaints went nowhere. Uh, I assume that it means uh, burglaries at this building. 
The shop had been stripped to the studs pending a sale. All the crooks were able to get away with were a couple of jugs of COVID-era hand sanitizer and a set of keys somebody left on the counter. Quote, I told somebody I'm too old to take a beating from a billy club. And my friends joked to me, is there an age limit to that? He explained that if he hadn't had a firearm, he may well have been beaten. We have many responsible gun owners here in Grant County, and if they're outside protecting their property, they can certainly hold someone at gunpoint and then call 911. <coughs> that was Sheriff's Office spokesman Kyle Foreman. Mr. K also said the irony, quotes around irony, behind the two criminals targeting his property wasn't lost on him, noting that He's the administrator behind a Facebook group of local farmers that keep each other updated on local crimes. Farmers had a, have a lot of capital equipment that's often stolen. They post photos of suspects on the page and have met with sheriff's office on how to best address rural crime in their area. Let me give you some perspective. Grant County is 200 miles from Seattle or Tacoma but it's seen an increase in crime as addicts look to make a quick buck to feed their addiction and head back to the big city. The county's first responders have an average of seven, almost eight fentanyl, fentanyl overdoses per month. That's average over the last year, right, last year. Mr. K said his boys got to the concert a bit late and had to settle for pizza because the burger stand was closed. Um, I, as you were starting this off, Rob, it, uh, it it brought to mind every once in a while you'll see on Facebook or other social media, uh, what they, three things can you buy at Walmart that will cause the most alarm when you hit the checkout line with them? Uh, going back to the store, he parked his truck, walked over to the car and looked in. Front passenger seat, there was a gas can. In the back, there were a massage table and a weed eater. Um what three things do not belong together? Good, good on this guy for having it set off alarm bells. Uh, but I, I think anybody looking in that car will be going, oh, this don't look right, man. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's like men's cowboy boots and women's jewelry. Yeah. How yeah. did those get in the same car? <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, we've talked about this many a time, but holding someone at gunpoint is not really the easiest thing in the world to do. No, it's hard. Yeah, you you got to, you, you, unless you are Schwarzenegger type, Schwarzenegger in his earlier movies type fit, holding somebody at gunpoint with your arms fully extended for a long period of time, that really wears on the shoulders. Um, mm hmm so, yeah, you, you, you need to be trained on how to do it and how to do it effectively. Uh, off to Columbia, South Carolina? Yep. All right. Uh, this one, again, out of Columbia. While we do not have any background on past incidents or what caused this one, a family is now having to pick up the pieces of their lives. A fight between a 40-year-old father and his 17-year-old son turned from verbal to physical. The father punched his son and placed him in a chokehold. He then overpowered the son and forced him to the ground where he continued to choke the teen. His mother attempted to intervene. As she was making her attempt, the son produced a handgun and fired shots and hit his father in the upper body. The father died at the home. Any injuries or the medical condition of the teen have not been reported, and deputies reviewed video footage and spoke with multiple witnesses. They provided consistent accounts of the incident, and the gun belonged to the mother. No charges will be filed as the, as the sh shooting has been determined to be a justifiable homicide. This family will never be the same, said Sheriff John Lott in, the pre in a press release. Our thoughts are with this young man and his family as they begin to process and heal. Um... Rob, I'm, I'm going to let you go first on this one, man. You're in show notes. Yeah, by the way, that was Sheriff Leon Lott, not John Lott. Yes. But that's okay. My, um, I seen Lott, my brain took over. 
that's and I was right there with you. I went, oh, how, oh, darn it. Too cold to be true. Guys, what do you want to bet that somebody there was intoxicated? Now, were they high? Were they drunk? M- maybe multiple, maybe both combat. Maybe there's no virtue here at all. They were both intoxicated. But sadly, that tells us something. If we're drinking, we need to be careful, both of our own temper and having guns around. Maybe it means if someone has a history of violence, you don't want to be around them. Hey, you've been drinking. You need to leave because you haven't shown you can control yourself. John, talk to me. Yeah, it's just a sad thing, you know, all around. Um, We don't know whether there was a history of abuse in the family. It sounds like there may have been, but we don't know. Normally, in a situation like this, I would have thought that the police would not have been. Uh, given that there, we don't know there was history of abuse, but I don't think they would have normally ruled it a self defense shooting so quickly. And just leave it at that. Paul? Um, we all. Everybody here is an advocate for self-defense. And quite quite a lot of the time, when you take training for self-defense, it's the, the assailant is a random person. Somebody kicked your door in. Somebody is accosting you at the ATM. Somebody is trying to rob the store while you are there. What is almost never in a scenario discussed is your father is drunk and starts choking you out. Um, could you shoot a family member if your life were truly in danger? And for a lot of us, that, that answer to that is no. Um, I can quite honestly think myself, there's one per- person on the face of this earth that com- that comes right to the straight to the top of my mind, I could not shoot her even if my life were in danger because of her, and that's my wife, Susan. Most likely, my sons, Michael and Robert, are right there along with my daughter, Amanda. However, it's it's something, it's it's painful to even contemplate, and, and for this kid yes. to have actually carried it out. Wow. Mm-hmm. All right, let me come down here and check uh, you know, we're still good on comments. Let's go ahead and we're going to shift gears here. I want to talk about what we've been doing in media, with media. Rob, as I normally do, I'm going to start with you. What's been going on over at Slow Facts, man? I wrote about Israel disarming its citizens, about Hillary Clinton saying that Trump voters need re-education camps to be deprogrammed, and about President Biden's lies about guns and how our president ignores the amazing virtues of American gun owners. You can find those articles at slowfacts.wordpress.com. Paul, you had a comment. Yeah, I do. Uh, I see it on social media, a, a, a smart aleck post, which are the ones that really tickle me the most is, is my health insurance going to cover that reprogramming or do I have to pay for that out of pocket. Right. Is, is And what's the deductible when I'm being sent <laughs> off to the labor camp for re-education? John, tell us what's new at your blog, No Lawyers, Only Guns and Money. Well, uh, after I cleanse, do ethnic cleansing, get Pol Pot out of my brain, um, I've reported in the past that the New York Attorney General's office took notice of former NRA First VP Willis Lee's critical post on Facebook and other social media. As I said, they want him to submit to a supplemental deposition. However, he and the NRA are balking at that, saying that his comments were nothing new. And I reached out to a number of former directors, and they disagreed. On Tuesday, the Judge Joel Cohn issued an order saying that Lee would have to sit for another deposition. Moving on, the terrorist war in Israel is a reminder that you are on your own. The government is relaxing, and we just talked about that extensively. Um, So I'll just move on from that. Finally, some good news. 
Manicor or Arms is leaving Illinois for the gun-friendly state of Illinois of South Carolina. And the move starts later this week, and good for them. It feeds right into what we were saying about Smith & Wesson moving down to Tennessee. Companies leaving anti-freedom states going to gun-friendly states. That and more is at OnlyGunsAndMoney.com. All right. I do want to remind everybody as we're on our way out the door, if you are a member of Facebook and you're so inclined, come look us up. There's a Facebook listeners group there. Just search for Polite Society Podcast Listeners on Facebook. That does wrap up another episode of the Polite Society Podcast. We'd like to thank our guest, Yehuda Reamer, for joining us tonight. So for Dana, John, Susan, Amanda, Robin, Charlie, Carrie Ann, and Rob, until next time, stay safe, be aware, and we'll see you down the road. Views and opinions on the show you just heard are those of the host and the guest and are not necessarily the views of any sponsors or other affiliations. But hey, not everyone is as smart as we are.